That's good. All right, if you have your Bible, turn to 1 John with me tonight, please. 1 John chapter 1. And uh, verse 1. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1. The Apostle John says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of Him, and declare to you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. When the Apostle John speaks, folks, he paints with a broad stroke. He certainly does. He encompasses a lot of time in one statement. Notice what he says in verse 1. That which was from the beginning. If you'll notice over there in John chapter number 1, he said, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. <clears throat> from the beginning. The Apostle John says, now remember who you're reading here tonight. This is an Apostle. This is John. Peter, James, and John were the three of the inner circle. They're the ones who were privileged to go with him to places that others could not go. And so the Apostle John was promised that he would not see death until he saw the coming of the Lord. Was that fulfilled? Yes, it was in the book of Revelation. He saw heaven open, behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. He not only saw the second advent of the Lord Jesus, he saw the millennium, he saw hell, damnation, and the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. Did John see all these things? Absolutely. Saw them with his own eye. So John says, that which was from the beginning. He's writing to you first person witness. He wants people that have never seen Christ to read his word. This is a witness and a testimony of what he knows to be true, for he was there. And notice how he says it. He says, we have heard, we have seen, we have looked upon, our hands have handled of the word of life. So there's no question in the mind of John that he is as, 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 uh, as reliable a witness as you could possibly ask. Remember now, this is the first century. These books are being written within the first 30 to 40 to 50 years after the death of the Lord Jesus and His ascension back into heaven. God intended for us to have His Word so that in the generations to come, we could bear witness with the witness of the one who was there during His lifetime, in the beginning, from the beginning. What is the beginning? What's John referring to here? The beginning of the ministry of Christ? The beginning of the creation of the world? The eternal past when nothing but God existed? I would say that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. I'd say that we go all the way back into the ages past, the one where the Bible says, known unto Him are all of His works, that one that knows everything, everything there is to know. He knows all things. We call that omniscience. That's one of the great terms in reference to God. In the beginning was the Word, he said in John chapter number 1. The Bible says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. In Genesis chapter number 1. Then the Bible says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the gospel of Mark. So there is a beginning with a lot of things, but there is no beginning with God. He said, we've heard, we've seen, we've looked upon, we've handled. The apostle Peter said it this way. He said, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
Peter says that upon that holy mountain, when the power of God came down and encapsulated our Lord Jesus Christ in glory, and he was shining brighter than the noonday sun, a voice from heaven spoke and said, This is my beloved son. This is my son. Not Moses and Elijah. This is my son. There's a difference between Moses and Elijah and the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses and Elijah exist because of the Lord Jesus Christ. They have no meaning. They have no ministry apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's exalted and manifested in his exaltation because of what God the Father says about his son. He wants heaven to know. He wants you to understand that he speaks from glory. And there he manifests forth the power and glory of Christ. This life was manifested, the apostle John says in verse number two. The life was manifested and we have seen it. He's trying in words of human phraseology to tell you that God incarnate in flesh was a sight to behold. He knew that the one he was looking at was a man, but he also knew he was God Almighty. And so that, he said, is the life manifested in the flesh. That eternal life, he says in verse number two, that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Notice how the terminology life is referred to a person. Life is personified. Notice carefully, it's important. The Lord Jesus Christ is eternal life. You say, he gave me eternal life. In a sense, you might say that. But the truth of the matter is, the Apostle John, on over here in the same book, says, he that hath the Son hath life. The Son of God, folks, is eternal life. You cannot have Jesus and not have eternal life. Nowhere is the church even mentioned. There's no reference to religion whatsoever. There's no reference to the commandments whatsoever in this statement. They're all covered in 1 John. But when it comes to the issue of eternal life, it boils down to one person, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Either you have the Son or you don't have the Son. I'm not interested if you've been baptized, christened, or if you're a member of your church, if you're trying to do the best you can, if you're trying to keep the commandments. The person of Christ is eternal life. If you do not have the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you do not have eternal life. And notice what he says here in verse number uh, four. He said, these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. The apostle Peter says that we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Joy is the unique gift to the church of God. The saint of God has the blessing of joy. A lot of people have happiness, but happiness is a fleeting thing. Happiness comes and happiness goes. They spend big bucks to try to buy happiness. And for a while, the excitement of some new thing, it will change their attitude and they'll find happiness in that for a short time. But it will soon wear off. But the joy of the Lord is the strength of the saint of God. And the joy of the Lord is completely independent of circumstances. It is a joy that is inbred because of your heritage. It is a joy that comes down because of the one you know. It is the joy that is associated directly with the Lord Jesus Christ and the giving of the Holy Spirit of God. And this is written for you to have joy. Why is it necessary to have joy, preacher? Because the joy of the Lord is your witness and testimony to a lost and dying world that you've got something they don't have. It is so important today for the church to get that message over to the world because the church today has gone out of its way to accommodate the world and, and accommodate the world's music. They accommodate its spirit. They accommodate its message. They accommodate everything to make a worldling feel comfortable. And what they've done in the process is lost their joy. Oh, they've got enthusiasm. There's a lot of emotionalism. There's all kinds of that going on. But you'll know if you have the joy of the Lord when the bottom drops out and it all goes against you and something good inside wells up in your soul and you can feel the presence of God and you can look into the face of it and say, I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. It is joy that is indescribable and it is the joy of the Lord. Notice what he's called here in verse number one. Our hands have handled of the word of life. That's a powerful statement. The word of life. 
The word of life is the Lord Jesus Christ, personified. Life is personified. Life is in a person. And the Son of God is the word of life. He speaks and dead people come to life. He speaks and lost dead people are saved. He speaks and the wind stops blowing. He speaks and demons flee in terror. He speaks and the Father listens. That's the word of life. None of his words fell to the ground. I give unto them eternal life, he said, and they shall never perish. You can be certain of this. If the Lord Jesus Christ said it, it is settled in heaven. If the Lord Jesus Christ said it, it is as settled in heaven as any written word there is. What came forth from the mouth of the Son of God is inspired scripture, every last syllable. Amen. Amen. The same one who said, let there be light, also said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. The same one who said, Adam, where art thou? Also said, go tell the disciples and Peter. The same one who said, the imagination of man's heart is only evil continually. Also said, it is finished. It came forth from his lips. The Bible says that he's the word of life. The word of life is personified and the word of life is written. You should be so thankful today that you have the holy word of God. You should be so thankful today that you have a Bible that you never hear corrected in this house. You should be thankful that you have a Bible you can hold in your hand and say, I believe that book from cover to cover is without error. The big word for it is inerrant. There, is no, there are no errors whatsoever in the Bible. You say, preacher, I've been taught there are. Well, they, have you found all of them yet? Are you certain yet what you're reading is true? Who is your authority? Which professor do you go to? When you go to your professor, what authority does he use? You say he uses a Greek manuscript. Which one? There are thousands of them out there. He, does he use an unctual or a cursive? Does he use the Alexandrian or the Washingtonius? Or does he use the Sinaiticus or the Vaticanus? Which manuscript does he use? You say, I didn't know all that existed. He's not going to tell you that. You pay to get that. What he's going to do is hold over your head the idea that he knows more than you do and that you are just a pawn in his hand and he'll manipulate your thinking. He'll tell you what to think, what to preach, what to believe. He'll control you. Therefore, he will establish the Nicolaitan authority where you're a pawn, you're the laity, and he's the clergy. And God said, I despise that kind of garbage. Amen. Amen. I have no use for clergy and laity. There are those out there that talk about the clergy and they're good men and they're simply said in ignorance because they don't know any better. Now, I don't want to offend anybody tonight, but the word is not in the Bible. It doesn't exist. You are a royal priesthood. This same book in the Apostle John says you have an unction from the Father, an unction from the Holy One. And he doesn't divide it here or there. He gives it to all. You have the ability and the right to get on your knees and open the Bible and be guided into all truth. Amen. Amen. It is a religious hierarchy that creates clergy and laity. And I believe with all of my heart that that is exactly what, Paul, what John was talking about in Revelation about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And so the Bible is very clear on it. It is the written word of God. It is a book that I can hold up and I can preach and believe every word of it. Amen. All it takes is a little leaven that leaveneth the whole lump. I believe the Bible. Search the scriptures, the Lord Jesus Christ said, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. The Bible says these things are written throughout the whole gospel of John that you might believe and believe have everlasting life. God is impossible for him to lie. The book of Hebrews makes it clear. God cannot lie. God left you a written record that you can trust with your very soul. The most precious thing you have in this world. What should it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? God is not a monster. He's not an ogre. He's not a liar. He's not a thief. If he leaves you his word, he left you his word to guide you into the truth so that you can know that you are saved by the grace of God. These things write we unto you. Look at what he says in verse 4. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full. The Apostle John is saying, I am writing to you the word of the living God. Notice in verse 5 he said, 
This then is the message which we've heard of him and declare to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. The Bible says God is light. The Bible said God is love. The Bible said God is the Spirit. The Bible said God is a consuming fire. The Bible teaches that God is omniscient. The Bible teaches that God is omnipotent. The Bible teaches that God is immutable. The Bible says that God is holy. The Bible says that God is righteous. The Bible says that God is the sovereign Lord God Almighty. And the Bible said that God is merciful, merciful, gracious, and long-suffering. These are the things that identify our God. He's a good God. He's a gracious God. He's a long-suffering God. It is our fallen nature. It is, our, it is, it is the hardness of our heart that, that causes us not to bow before him and yield before him our very life and take into our soul the goodness and the greatness of our God tonight because he's good to us, folks. It is our hard heart of unbelief. If we would open that heart, soften that heart, we would say, Lord, you've been good to me. You deserve my praise. You deserve glory. You deserve everything that I could possibly give you. What can I give you that you haven't already given me? Amen. Amen. But the hardness of our heart and our pride and our arrogance keeps us from doing that very thing. We want to fellowship with each other. I heard a man put it real good the other day, and I thought this is something. He said, we grab and complain about this. We grab and complain about that. We grab, we grab, we complain, we complain. He said, then we get together and complain to each other and call it fellowship. I thought that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> I heard that on the radio. Yes, amen. God is light. Light is opposed to darkness. There's two kinds of darkness. There's the darkness of ignorance. Then there's the darkness of wickedness. There's the darkness that willfully refuses the light. For this cause, God sends them a strong delusion. The Bible said this is the condemnation. Light is coming to the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. When you turn from the light, what do you turn to? If you turn away from knowledge, what do you turn to? Where do you go when you leave Christ? Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Peter could rise to the highest high and fall to the lowest low. The apostle Peter could stand tall and walk on water and he could speak up above the apostles and say, where can we go? Where can we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. We believe and are sure thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Let me tell you something tonight. There is nowhere to go. <laughs> Lord of God, there's no savior. There's no other name. God said in the book of Isaiah, thundered it out and said, I don't know of any other God. There's no other Savior beside me. He doesn't exist. I'm all there he is. There's none beside me. And he said, my word will come down as the rain that comes down from heaven and the snow that falleth on the earth. It will bring forth its fruit in due time. There's one God and one God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. And that's the name of Jesus. There's one name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. God the Father one day will hear them all all say Jesus and when he hears that name it is the name of his earthly humiliation it is the name of the of the of the of the, of the God man of the of the son of man is the son of man's name and his name is Jesus Jesus Jehovah saves that's the name that the father will hear that day that's the name Gabriel said to Mary call him Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins there is the darkness, therefore, of ignorance and the darkness of wickedness. The problem is that the darkness of ignorance will cause one to fall into wickedness. Because without the light and without Christ and his righteousness and his precious blood, you have no guard against the devil. The Bible said he can take you captive at his will. And he certainly does that. The God of this world blinds their minds. He is their God. He, weigh, he has power in this world. He has authority in this world. He has legal authority to execute judgment upon an unbeliever. He can smite him to death if he so pleases. And only by the grace of God does it not happen. With you, he's got to get permission to even touch a hair on your head. <laughs> Amen. How do you know that, preacher? Because the Lord said, Peter, Satan hath requested, has desired. 
He came to me. You didn't know anything about it. I didn't hold a meeting, didn't make an announcement. But Satan came to me and requested that he might take you and sift you as wheat. In other words, it is that same story back to the book of Job. When he stood before the Lord and said, Doth Job serve thee for naught? You let him, me have him for a little while. I'll take Job. I'll turn him inside out. And I'll show you and I'll show the whole creation that there's nobody going to serve you for who you are because they know you and because of goodness. Job is serving you because you've been good to him. You've blessed him. He has a fence built around him. He's got a hedge about him. And you remove that hedge and he He'll curse you to your face. God said, go ahead. And when it ended up, Job said, I'd preached your word. I'd witnessed and testified. I'd told people how great you were. I'd done all this and prayed and I'd fasted and I'd ministered. All these things I thought I knew you. But now mine eye hath seen thee. And I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. The end when Job wound up at his end. The Bible says in the New Testament, have you seen the end of Job? When Job wound up in his end, he wound up repenting and confessing to God that he was even bigger than he ever thought he was. He was greater than he ever thought he was. He was beyond his mental comprehension that he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not at that time was none, but, but he would be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The covenant keeping God. He was the great God. Amen. And Satan couldn't do a thing about it. That's the battle that still rages. It still rages. Satan tries his best to justify everything that he does. And he cannot justify himself. So light is opposed to darkness. In him was life, the Bible says in John chapter number 1, and the life was the light of men. The life was the light of men. Boy, that's a wonderful statement. Think about it for a minute. Think about it. Doesn't it inspire you when you see a Christian go through a hard time and you know they're going through a hard time and you know they're having a, you know they're having a hard time, you know they're hurting and you know that it's not something they chose but it's just part of life. The Bible said that they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer what? The Bible said the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You see a son of God, a daughter of the Lord, you see them go through a hard time. And then you watch grace begin to come out and be ministered in their life. And you see something that's greater than you and greater than them. You see the grace of God being ministered. What you're looking at is life. That life gives you light. That life draws you. It's what, what drew you to Christ, the fact that he is the son of God. He is life personified. Death doesn't draw people. It's not going to draw you to anything. Everybody dies. But the life that was manifest in the flesh, your witness and your testimony to this dying world is far more than what comes out of your mouth. Your witness and testimony to this dying world is the life you live. That is, that, listen, what you say whispers. But how you live screams into their very ears. You've preached to them. You've witnessed to them. You've given them tracts. You've told them about the Lord. These are all good things. But make no mistake. The day will come when they'll watch you. And everything you said, they're going to compare it to how you deal with what you go through in this world. And you can't do it on your own. You can't do it. You don't have that ability. You have to do it by the grace of God. The grace of God is where God ministers grace to you in the midst of hardships and problems. Grace received is grace ministered. And grace that comes into your life brings the power of God. Grace, grace, grace. Over there in the Old Testament, when the book of Zechariah, where, uh, where, where Zechariah, where the Bible says that Joshua was standing before the Lord, and the Bible, Joshua was the high priest, and the Bible says, standing in his right hand was Satan to hinder him. Well, the whole idea was that God is restoring the priesthood. He's restoring the temple sacrifice. He's bringing them back into himself. And Satan is going to hinder it all he possibly can. And so he does. He does everything he can do to hinder it. But the Bible tells you there, if you go home, read it tonight when you get to the house. Read what happens in Zechariah where it says, And they shall lay the stone with shoutings of grace, grace, grace. And what they're saying is, not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. The grace of God is ministered through the spirit of the living God. Satan works through the power of the flesh, 
through insinuations, innuendos, lies, deception. That's the power of Satan. The power of Christ is the grace of God ministered by the Spirit of the living God. Amen. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Get on your knees and say, Lord God, I'm weak. I need help. I need strength. And he's not, he'll not give you strength of your own. He'll give you his strength. You'll become more reliant upon it. But you'll feel it. And you'll feel the power of God moving in your soul. And that is ministered by grace. And make no mistake, a lost and dying world will witness that grace. They'll see it. And when they see it, they will have to acknowledge that there's something going on that's much greater than them. What do you see? The power of Satan. The power of sin, the power of unbelief, an unsaved man. I see in this world exactly the foes arrayed against each other. I look about me and I see two worlds. I see the world of the saved. I see the world of the unsaved. I see the spiritual battle that rages every day. I see the Christians as they want this world of the Lord, but they have one foot in this world of Satan. They can't turn it all loose. They want this, but they can't turn that loose. And so they're stuck with both, and you can't have both. It won't work. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. You have to make a, a choice. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Come out from among them and be a separate, saith the Lord. That's what God said to do. You've got to. He said, I'll receive you and be a father to you. And therefore, you have to make a choice. Ask God to give you wisdom. A prayer for that tonight for you is this. Lord, Give me the spiritual discernment and wisdom that I can see the real battle that preacher's talking about. That I can really see the spiritual struggle that's going on. And you'll begin to see it. You'll begin to understand it. And then once you understand your enemy and the tactics of your enemy, then you know how to put on the whole armor of God that the apostle talks about. And when you put that armor on, we're not talking about a physical armor. We're talking about spiritual armor. And the, by the armor that can pull down strongholds. And, Take that over there where he's talking about the whole armor of God in Ephesians and take over there in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 7 and chapters 10 where the apostle Paul is talking about how that you are pulling down strongholds and you have a stronghold in the mind and the mind must be disciplined and the more you discipline your mind, the more you begin to gain power over the flesh. The biggest struggle in your life will be right up here in your head. It'll be in the mind. But the, well, you, don't, you don't defeat the mind with the mind. You can't do that. How do you defeat the mind? On your knees. With the power of the Holy Spirit of God, receiving strength to overcome, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and being a readiness to avenge all disobedience. You've got to do that. There's no other way. It has to be done by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. There's liberty in the gospel Luke chapter number 4, verse number 18. Here's the greatest preacher that ever lived. Here's what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and gave it again to the minister, and sat down. That had to be a thing to see. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say to them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. That had to be a marvelous sight. He was reading from the book of Isaiah. I think it's chapter number 61. Reading the scripture. Reading the scripture. The book he wrote himself. Then he closed it. And he handed it to the minister. And said, This day, no fanfare. No singing, no shouting, no horns blowing, nothing. He just simply said, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And I'm going to close with this tonight. I want you to notice how in verse number 7 he said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. You want to have fellowship with each other? Walk in the light of God. If you walk in his light, you will have fellowship with each other. Now, if you've got a bunch of goats around, button this and button that, you're, you can't fellowship with a goat. But if they're born again, if they're sheep, you'll fellowship with them. And your fellowship is with the Father about the Son. You'll fellowship. The Greek word for fellowship is koinonia. That means to have in common. You'll have in common with your brothers and sisters. Now, John makes a big deal in here about how you love your brother. And if you don't love your brother whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you haven't seen? 
And he said, hereby perceive we the love of God. He's laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for each other. John is, doesn't give you a little milk toast, to mushy, mushy definition of love. With, with the apostle John's definition of love is pretty tough. You gotta be willing to die for each other. That's strong stuff. But if you had that kind of love for each other, then you have real fellowship with each other. And real fellowship is a powerful thing. It's powerful. So notice that the fellowship that we have with each other is not based on what we do and what we know and what we've accomplished. It's all based around a person. It's about a person. When we showed up in here tonight, we showed up for Jesus, not Preacher Lawson. We showed up in this house tonight for the, not for the Baptist, but for Christ. We came out tonight to come in here to glorify the Lord, not a man. And my life, the life that I now live in the flesh, the apostle says, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For to me to live, Paul said, is Christ. That's what we're about. We're about a person. We're about the Son of God. That's why you don't hear anything in here about great men, great movements, great buildings, great this, great that. They're not great. He's great. Amen. If there's any greatness about any man that ever walked this earth and breathed like I breathe, he only has it because of the grace of God. Amen. 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 We're nothing. We're nothing. We are nothing. We're less than nothing. John 15 makes it plain. Without him, you can do nothing. Amen. So I love fellowship. I think fellowship's a wonderful thing. Remember, though, fellowship is not everybody griping and complaining to each other and calling that fellowship. And fellowship is not saying who won the pennant and who won the World Series and who won the Super Bowl and, and who caught the biggest fish and told the biggest lie about it and who did this and who did that. That's not fellowship. Fellowship is the witness of the Spirit among us. And we know. You can always tell when you're talking to somebody about the Lord if they're bored to death or if they want to talk about it. You can. It just comes natural if you know it. If you're bored with the Lord Jesus, you're bored with yourself. <laughs> Amen. And I guarantee you, that's why an unsaved man is constantly has to be, he has to have some flashing light, some tickling the senses, some emotional experience, some new thing, something. Constantly, you ever, know, ever watched them? You, you, you ever notice how that the unsaved are very seldom, it's very rare, very rare to find an unsaved person in quietness. Check it out. They want noise. And the reason they want noise is because they don't want to listen to what's going on inside. But I love the quiet. Now, I hate to tell you this tonight. That's a sad thing. But I've been sitting on my porch now for two weeks, and I haven't heard the first chirp come out of that nest. Those little birdies must be gone. They left quickly. And I didn't see any on the porch, so they didn't fall out of there. And no cat got to them because of where it's located. And it's amazing how God takes care of the little old creatures like that. But they're all gone. I miss them. <laughs> I got used to hearing those little birds chirping up there. And you get used to that. And now they're gone. But I'm glad they're free. Everything's got its place. It knows what it's here for. The foxes have their holes. The birds have their nest. Fowls have their nest. You know, the ox knows its crib. All that. What do you say about us? We can send men to the moon, but we don't know where our water comes from. You know, we can, we, can, we can chart the human genome, but we don't have a clue what the Spirit's about. We're completely ignorant of certain things. But you shouldn't be, dear Christian friend. Father, in thy holy name, Lord, I've delivered what you put on my soul. And I thank you for being with me this day. I bless and praise thy holy name. You've been good to me, Lord. You've been good to me. You've been good to me. Father, there are those, Lord, tonight that may be hungry. They may be, they may be hungry. And their Heavenly Father, you said, come, take, eat. Come and dine. Sit down by the fire. The fish is hot. It's ready. Come and dine. They may be thirsty. And take them to a well and tell them where the water is going to come from. And then tell them about water that will be an everlasting life inside them. Jesus, glorify thy name, Savior. I'm done. In thy name I pray. Amen. 
All right, we're standing out. Page 370 in your All-American, 370. <clears throat> Lord, kids had a good time in Bible school. Thank the teachers again, all of you that got together and worked hard to do what you're doing. You having your thing this weekend? All right, what are you, what are you doing? Do they know better? 